Hi everyone and welcome back to Book Club with Ms. Dub. I'm Ms. Dub and we are going to be diving in today to chapter 15 of The City of Ember by Jean Dupro. If you are one of my students, as always, will you please um, turn on closed captioning, put it on full screen, uh, use your headphones, and please close all other tabs and windows. That way you get the most out of this uh, chapter and you will do the best on your assignments that you possibly can. All right, let's jump into chapter 15. I will be using some character um, cards as well as setting cards, etc. So let's go ahead. Chapter 15 is called A Desperate Run. But this can't be right, said Dune. If the river is the way out of Ember, why is there just one boat? It's only big enough for two people. I don't know, said Lena. It is strange. Let's look around some more. They stood up. Dune went back to where they'd left the boxes and got another candle. He brought it into the room and lit it, and the room grew twice as bright. Right away, they saw that they saw what they hadn't noticed before. In the back wall was a door almost as wide as the whole room. When they went up to it, they could see that it too was a sliding door. Dune took hold of the handle that was on the right and pulled sideways and the door rolled smoothly open to reveal more darkness. They stepped in. They could guess from the echoing sound of their voices when they spoke that they were in a tremendous room. Though the ceiling was low, they could see they could see it just over their heads. The candlelight glinted off something shiny, and as they went in farther, they could see that the room was filled with boats, row upon row of them, just like the one in the first room. There must be hundreds, Lena whispered. Enough for everyone, I suppose, said Dune. They wandered around a bit, where, but there wasn't really much to see. All the boats were the same. Each one contained two metal boxes and two paddles. The room was cold and the air felt heavy in their lungs. The candle flames burned weakly. So they went back to the small room and slid the door closed behind them. I guess, said Lena, that this first boat is meant as a sort of sample. We learn what, what's what on the one that has signs, boat, paddles, candles, matches. They went back out to the river's edge. Let's see. Lena blew out her candle and began closing up the boxes they'd opened. Dune blew out his too. I'm going to take my candle with me, um, he said, to look at later. I want some matches as well. He took a packet of matches from the box and tucked it inside his shirt. Lena returned the boxes to the boat room and slid the door closed. Then she and Dune stood together on the ledge and gazed down. Less than a foot below, the river rushed by. A short distance downstream, it plunged into the dark mouth in the wall and disappeared. Well, we found it. We found it, Lena repeated wonderingly. And tomorrow, at the start of the singing, said Dune, we'll stand up in Harkin Square and tell the whole city. When they came up out of the pipeworks, sorry, when they came up out of the pipeworks, it was nearly six o'clock. They hadn't realized they'd been down there so long. Both Dune's father and Mrs. Murdo would be wondering where they were. They stood for a moment under a lamppost, just long enough to agree on a time to meet the next day and plan their announcement. When they, then they hurried home. When Dune's father asked why he was so late, he said his song rehearsal had gone long. He wanted to shout out to his father, we found the way out, we're saved. But he held himself in for the sake of, this, of his moment of glory. Tomorrow, when his father saw him on the steps of the gathering hall, 
he would be so overcome with surprise and pride that he would go weak in the knees and the people standing next to him would have to catch him and hold him up. And the announcement about the thieving mayor, that would probably happen tomorrow too. Dune had almost forgotten in the excitement of finding the boats, the mayor's arrest and the city's rescue both at once. It was going to be an amazing day. Racing thoughts kept Dune awake almost all morning. The day of the singing was a holiday for the entire city. All the stores and other businesses were closed. This meant that Dune didn't have to go to the pipeworks. His father didn't have to go to his shop either, but he was going to go anyhow. If he wasn't in his shop, his uh, fussing with his merchandise, he didn't know what to do with himself. Dune dawdled over his breakfast of carrot sticks and mashed turnips, waiting for his father to go. He wanted to get ready for the journey down the river. They probably wouldn't leave for a few days. He and Lena would make their announcement tonight, and people would need time to get organized before they could leave the city. But he was too excited to sit around doing nothing. As soon as his father left, Dune slipped the case off his pillow. This would be his traveling pack. He put in the candle and the matches. He put in the key he'd borrowed from the pipeworks office. He put in a good sized piece of rope that he'd found at the trash heaps and had been saving for years and a bottle for water. He put in an ancient folding knife that his father had given him, which had come down through generations of his family and which he used to chop off his bangs when they got so long they tickled his eyelids. He put in some extra clothes in case he got wet and some paper and a pencil so he could write a record of the journey. Along with these things, he crammed in a small blanket, it might be cold in the new city, and a packet of food, six carrots, a handful of vitamins, some peas and mushrooms wrapped in a lettuce leaf, two boiled beets and two boiled turnips. That should be enough. Surely when they got to where they were going, the people who lived there would give them something to eat. He tied the top of the pillowcase in a knot and then he untied it again. He might want to add something else. He stood in the middle of the apartment and looked around at the jumble of stuff. There was nothing else he wanted here that he wanted to take with him. No, there was one thing. He went back into his room. From beneath his bed, he pulled out the pages of his bug book. He leafed through it, the white spider, the moth with the zigzag pattern on its wings the bee striped brown and yellow on its rear end. He looked at his drawings for a long time, memorizing their beauty and strangeness. Tiny fringes of hair, minute claws, jointed legs. Should he take this with him? There might not be creatures like this where they were going. He might never see such things again. But no, he'd leave it behind. His pack should be small and light. He put the bug book back under his bed and pulled out the box where he kept the green worm. He drew back the scarf to check his captive one one more time. His captive one more time. Several days before, the worm, the worm had done a curious thing. It had wrapped itself up in a blanket of threads. Since then, it had, been, it had hung motionless from a bit of a cabbage stem. Dune had been watching it carefully. Either it was dead or it was undergoing the change that he'd read about in a library book but could hardly believe was true. The change from a crawling thing to a flying thing. So far, the bundled up worm had shown no signs of life. But now he saw that it was wriggling. The whole wrapped up bundle, which was shaped like a large vitamin pill, bent slightly from side to side, then was still and then then bent back and forth again. Something was pushing at the top end of it. And in a moment, the threads there split apart and a dark furry knob emerged. Dune watched, holding his breath. Next came two hair-like legs, which clawed and plucked at the blanket. In a few minutes, the whole creature was out, egress thought Dune with a smile. The creature's wings were crushed flat against its body at first, but soon they opened and Dune saw what his green worm had become, a moth with light brown wings. 
He lifted the box and carried it to the window. He opened the window and held the box out into the air. The moth waved its feathery feelers and took a few steps along the wilted cabbage leaf. For several minutes, it stood still, its wings trembling slightly. Then it fluttered up into the air, rising higher and higher until it was just a pale spot against the dark sky. Dune watched until the moth disappeared. He knew he had seen something marvelous. What was the power that turned the worm into a moth? It was greater than any power the builders had had. He was sure of that. The power that ran the city of Ember was feeble by comparison and about to run out. For a few minutes, he stood by the window looking out over the square and thinking again about what to pack for his journey. Should he put in anything like nails or wire? Would he need money? Should he take some soap? And then he laughed and struck a hand against his head. He kept forgetting the entire population of the city would be with him on the trip. If he needed something he didn't have, someone would surely be able to supply it. So he tied a knot in his pillowcase and was about to close the window when he caught sight of three burly men wearing the red and brown uniform of the city guards striding into the square. They stopped and looked around for a moment. Then one of them confronted old humpbacked Nami Progs, who was standing not far from the entrance to the small item shop. The guard towered over her and she twisted her head sideways and squinted up at him. Dune could hear the guard's voice clearly. We're looking for a boy named Harrow. Why, said Nami. Spreading vicious rumors was the answer. Do you know where he is? Nami hesitated a moment and then she said, went off to the trash heaps just a minute ago. The guard nodded curtly and beckoned to his companions. They marched away. Spreading vicious rumors? Dune was so stunned that he stood still as stone for a long minute. What could that possibly mean? But there was only one answer. It had to be what they'd told the assistant guard about the mayor. Why were they calling it a vicious rumor? It was the truth. He didn't understand it. He did understand, though, that Nami Progs had done him a favor. She must have seen that the guards meant him no good. She had protected him, at least for the moment, by sending the guards to the wrong place. Dune forced his mind to slow down and think. What did the guards think he and why did the guards think he and Lena were lying? Obviously, they hadn't investigated the room in Tunnel 351. If they had, they'd have known he and Lena were telling the truth. He could think of only one other possibility. The guards, at least some of them, already knew what the mayor was doing. They knew about it and wanted it to stay a secret. And why? It was clear. The guards, too, were getting things from the storerooms. It had to be the answer. For a moment, the fear he'd felt when he saw the guards was replaced by rage. The familiar hot wave rose in him and he wanted to grab a handful of his father's nails or pot shards and throw them against the wall. But all at once, he remembered. If the guards were after him, they'd be after Lena too. He had to warn her. He dashed down the stairs, his anger turning into power for his running feet. After discovering the room full of boats, Lena had come home to Mrs. Murdo with the sound of the river still in her ears. It was like a huge, powerful voice roaring at the top of its lungs. Deep inside herself, Lena felt an answering call as if she too contained a drop of the same power. She would ride on the river. She could hardly believe it. And it might take her to the shining city she had dreamed of. Or it might drown her. What she had imagined before, the smooth, gently sloping path leading out, now seemed childish. She dreaded going on the river but she was ready for it too. She longed to go. 
She slept that night in the beautiful blue-green room in the big lumpy bed with Poppy next to her. She felt safe here. Mrs. Murdo came in and tucked the covers around her. She sat on the edge of the bed and sang an odd little song to Poppy, something about rock a -bye, baby in the treetops. What are treetops? Lena asked, but Mrs. Murdo didn't know. It's a very old song, she said. It's probably nonsense words. She said goodnight and went out into the living room where Lena could hear her humming quietly as she tidied up. She was so orderly. She never left her stockings draped over the back of a chair or her sewing spread out all over the table. Lena closed her eyes and waited for sleep, but her thoughts kept tumbling around. So much was going to happen tomorrow. The whole city would be in an uproar. People would stream down in the, into the pipeworks to see the boats. They'd be excited, shouting and laughing and crying, packing up their belongings and surging through the streets. If they couldn't all fit into the boats, there would be fights. Some people might get hurt. It was going to be a mess. She'd have to keep her little family close to her. Poppy, Mrs. Murdo, and Dune, and perhaps Dune's father, Aunt Clary. Though through it all, she would hold tight to Poppy so no harm could come to her. It seemed she had barely closed her eyes when she felt Poppy's hard little heels banging against her shins. Time to get up, get up, Poppy chirped. She got out of bed and dressed herself and Poppy. In the kitchen, Mrs. Murdo was mashing potatoes for breakfast. How lovely, Lena thought, to have breakfast cooked for her, to hear water bubbling in the pot and to find a bowl and a spoon set out on the table and vitamins lined up neatly beside a cup of beet tea. I could live here forever, Lena thought, before she remembered that in a day or two, they would all be leaving. There was a sudden banging on the front door. Mrs. Murdo dried her hands and went to answer it, but before she'd taken three steps, the banging came again. I'm coming, I'm coming, Mrs. Murdo cried, and when she opened the door, there was Dune. His face was flushed and he was breathing hard. He had a bulging pillowcase slung over his shoulder. He looked past Mrs. Murdo to Lena. I have to talk to you, he said, right now, but he threw a doubtful glance at Mrs. Murdo. Lena scrambled up from the table. In here, she said, towing him toward the blue-green room. When she had closed the door, Dune told her what had happened. They'll come for you too, he said, any minute. We have to get out of here. We have to hide from them. Lena could hardly make sense of what he was saying. They were in trouble? Her legs went shaky at the knees. Hide? She said, hide where? We could go to the school. No one would be there today or the library. It's almost always open, even on holidays. He hopped impatiently from foot to foot, but we have to go fast. We have to go now. They have signs up all over the city. Signs? Telling people to report us if they see us. Lena felt as if a swarm of insects was inside her head buzzing so loudly she couldn't think. How long do we have to hide? All day? I don't know, but we, have, we, ha we don't have time to think about it. Lena, they could be outside the door this minute. The urgency in his voice convinced her. On the way through the living room, she gave Poppy a quick kiss and called, Bye, Mrs. Murdo. We have some emergency work to do. If anyone comes asking for me, say I'll be back later. They were down the stairs before Mrs. Murdo could ask any questions. Once in the street, they ran. Where to? Lena asked. The school, Dune answered. They took Greystone Street, staying within the shadows as much as they could. As they passed the shoe shop, Lena saw a white piece of paper stuck up on the window. She glanced at it and her heart gave a wild jump. Her name and Dunes were written on it in big black letters. Dune, Harrow, and Lena Mayfleet. Wanted for spreading vicious rumors. If you see them, report to Mayor's Chief Guard. Believe nothing, they say. Reward. She snatched the poster off the window, crumpled it up, and tossed it in the nearest trash can. 
In the next block, she tore down two more and Dune ripped one off a lamppost, but there were too many to get them all and they didn't have time to waste. They ran faster. On this holiday, people slept late and because the stores were closed, the streets were nearly empty. Still, they took the long route all the way out by the beehives to avoid Sparks Hollow Square, where a few people might be standing around and talking. They ran past the greenhouses and up Deadlock Street. As they crossed Knight Street, Lena glanced to her left. Two blocks away, a couple of guards were crossing the Green Gate Square. She tapped Dune's shoulder and pointed. He saw and they ran faster. Had they been noticed? Lena thought not. They would have heard a shout if the guards had seen them. They got to the school and went in through the back door. In the wide hallway, their footsteps echoed on the wooden floor. It was strange to be here again and to be here alone without the clatter and chatter of other children. The hallway with its eight doors seemed smaller to Lena than it had when she was a student and shabbier. The planks of the floor were scuffed gray and there was a cloud of finger smudges around the doorknob of every door. They went into Miss Thorne's room and out of habit, they sat at their old desks. I don't think they'll look for us here, said Dune. If they do, we can crawl into the paper cabinet. He set his pack down next to him on the floor. For a while, they just sat there getting their breath back. They hadn't turned the lights on, so the room was dim. The only light came from beneath the blind over the window. Those posters, Lena said after a while. Yes, everyone will see them. What will they do if they catch us? I don't know. Something to keep us from telling what we know. Put us in the prison room, maybe. Lena ran her finger along the bee carved in the desk top. It felt like a very long time since she'd last sat at this desk. We can't hide in here forever, she said. No, said Dune, just until it's time for the singing. Then when everyone is gathered in Harkin Square, we'll go and tell about the boats and the mayor, won't we? I haven't really thought about it. I haven't had a chance to think all this morning. But the guards are always there at the singing, standing next to the mayor. They'd grab us as soon as we opened our mouths. Dune's eyebrows came together in a dark line. You're right. So what will we do? It was like finding yourself on a dead end street, Lena thought. There was no way out. She stared blankly at the things that had once been her daily companions, the teacher's desk, the um, stacks of paper. The book of the city of Ember on its special shelf, the old words ran through her head. There is no place but Ember. Ember is the only light in the dark world. She knew now that this wasn't true. There was someplace else, the place where the boats would take them. As if Dune had read her thoughts, he looked up. We could go. Go where, she said, though she knew right away what he meant. Wherever the river leads, he said. He gestured to the pillowcase sack. I packed up my bag this morning. I'm all ready. I'm sure I have enough for you too. Lena felt her heart shrink a little. Go by ourselves, she said, without telling anyone? We will tell them. Dune was on his feet now. He went to the cabinet and got a sheet of paper. We'll write a note explaining everything. A note to someone we trust, someone who'll believe us. But I can't just leave, said Lena. How could I leave Poppy and not even say goodbye to her? Not know where I'm going or if I'm ever coming back? How could you go without saying goodbye to your father? Because, said Dune, once they find the boat, the rest of Ember will follow us. It's not as if we're leaving them forever. He strode across the room and rummaged, rummaged in Miss Thorne's desk. Who shall we write the message to? Lena wasn't sure about this idea. But she couldn't, at the moment, think of a better one. So she said, we should write it to Clary. She's seen the instructions. She'll believe what we say. 
and she lives close by, just up in Torek Square. Okay, said Doom. He pulled a pencil from the desk drawer. Really, he said, this is a perfect idea. We can get away from the guards and leave our message behind us. And we can be the first ones to arrive in the new city. We should be the first because we discovered the way. Well, that's true, Lena thought for a minute. How long do you think it will take before the rest of them find the boats and come? It's a lot of people to get organized. She numbered on her fingers the things that would have to happen. Clary will have to get the head of the pipeworks to go down with her and find the boats. Then she'll have to make the announcement to the city. Then everyone in Ember will have to pack up their things, troop down to the river, get all those boats out of that big room and load themselves in. It could be a big mess, Dune. Poppy will need me. She pictured frenzied crowds of people and Poppy tiny and lost among them. Poppy has Mrs. Murdo, said Dune. She'll be fine, really. Mrs. Murdo is very organized. It was true. The thought of taking Poppy with her on the river, which had darted into Lena's mind, darted out again. I'm only being selfish, she thought, to want to have her with me. It's too dangerous to take her. Mrs. Murdo will bring her in a day or two. This seemed the most sensible plan, though it made her so sad that it cast a shadow over the thrill of going to the new city. What if something goes wrong, she said. Nothing will go wrong. It's a good plan, Lena. We'll be there ahead of everyone else. We can welcome them when they come. We can show them around. Dune was bursting with eagerness. His eyes shone and he jiggled up and down. Well, all right, Lena said. Let's write our message then. Dune wrote for a long time. When he was, sorry, when he was finished, he showed what he'd written to Lena. He'd explained how to find the rock with the E how to go down to the boat room, and even how to use candles. It's good, she said. Now we have to deliver it. She paused a moment to see if she had any courage inside her. She found that she did, along with sadness and fear and excitement. I'll deliver it, she said. I'm the messenger after all. I know back ways to go where no one will see me. An idea struck her. Dune, maybe Clary will be home. Maybe she would keep us safe and help us tell what we know, and we won't have to leave right now. Dune quickly shook his head. I doubt it, he said. She's probably with her singing group getting ready. You'll just have to leave the note under her door. Lena could tell from his tone of voice that Dune didn't really want Clary to be home. She supposed he had his heart set on their going down the river by themselves. Dune glanced up at the clock on the schoolroom wall. It's a little after two, he said. The singing begins at three. After that, everyone will be in Harkin Square and the streets will be empty. I think we can get to the pipework safely then. Why don't we leave about a quarter after three? You still have the key? Dune nodded. So after I've delivered the note to Clary, I'll come back here, said Lena. Yes, and then we'll wait until 3.15 and then we'll go. Lena got up from the cramped desk and went to the window. She moved the blind a little and peered out. There was no one in the street. The dusty schoolroom was very quiet. She thought about Dune's father who would be frantic when he saw his son's name on those posters and then realized later that Dune had disappeared. She thought about Mrs. Murdo who might already have seen the posters and who would be ter and who would be frightened if guards came looking for Lena and terrified if Lena didn't come home by nightfall. She tried not to think about Poppy at all. She couldn't bear it. Give me the note, she said to Dune at last. She folded the piece of paper carefully and put it in the pocket of her pants. Back soon, she said, and went out of the room and down the hall to the rear door of the school. Dune went to the window to watch her go. He moved the blind aside just enough to see out into Pibb Street. There she was running in that long legged way with her hair flying. She started across the stone, uh, she started across Stone Grit Lane. Just before she reached the other side, Dune's breath stopped in his throat. Two guards rounded the corner from Knack Street directly ahead of her. One of them was the chief guard. 
He leapt forward and shouted so loudly, Dune could hear him plainly through the glass. That's her, get her. Lena reversed her direction in an instant. She raced back down Pitt Street, turned down School Street toward Bilbolio Square and vanished from Dune's sight. The guards ran after her shouting. Dune watched sick with horror. She's much faster than they are, he told himself. She'll lose them. She knows places to hide. He stood frozen next to the window, hardly breathing. They won't catch her, he thought. I'm sure they won't catch her. That's the end of chapter 15. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, please, please, please give this video a thumbs up. Um, remember students, if we get lots of thumbs up, we also get a prize. So don't forget to click that thumbs up. Um, please subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Uh, check out some of my other videos if you are looking for some more awesome books to listen to. And as always, I can't wait to read again with you soon. Bye.